Welcome back to the Tony Casillas Show. And I am so excited about my next guest because I followed his career. Uh, I'm much older than him, but I've watched him play the game of football, quarterback. And I actually ran into him, was I think it was five years ago when they had the implosion of the old Candlestick Park. This guy is was a four-time pro bowler, played for the 49ers, the Eagles. Man, man Eagles, the 49ers, <laughs> two guys. But it, the thing about this guy, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to bring him in, Jeff Garcia, is that I did I started reading your bio. You know, it's amazing when you start reading things about you. you still hold the single season passing record for the San Francisco 49ers, and brother, that's pretty, that's pretty bold words right there, considering you had Montana and you had Steve Young. So, hey, thanks for coming on, brother. You got it, Tony. Hey, I've always been a fan of you, man, especially <laughs> since. Uh, we share some common threads in our backgrounds. Not a whole lot of May Finals <laughs> playing in the National Football League. So you got to support your 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 likeness, right? But no, just watching you throughout your career, and uh, even at University of Oklahoma, watching you back in the day. Um, it's a pleasure to be on here. Thank you for having me, man. Thank you. I and that's a, and before we we started. Uh, I said, hey, habla español because my producer said that you were fluent Spanish. So I'm thinking, what? You know, what, what kind of information give me that? And, poquito. and as I mentioned, I had 65 first cousins. And the only bad words I knew, the only good words I, that I ever heard, or, no, the, the word, Spanish that speaking around my uncles sitting around was all the bad words in Spanish. So I think that that's, yeah, we do have that in common. And it sounds like the same we have in common that we don't know much Spanish, but that's okay. That's okay, man. We still represent the community, and uh, we're proud of our backgrounds, proud of our community, and uh, we want to do whatever we can to help them out and inspire them as well. So, you know, that for me was a lot of my motivation. I mean, my dad, full-blooded Mexicano, grew up uh, with immigrant parents coming from Mexico into the Central Coast area of California, and they were crop pickers they were in the fields picking lettuce tomato strawberries cucumbers yeah. whatever was in season that was their means of survival and knowing that my dad came from that background that that was his work ethic that was his childhood mm -hmm. basically his saturdays and sundays were spent early mornings out there picking probably before school monday through friday out there picking i mean the guy had a tough life in the sense of hard work and what he did as far as his perseverance, I think says a lot about what was instilled in me and just knowing that background, knowing where he came from, identifying with that community, with the Hispanic community, and just being proud to be a representative of that. Even though I look like a wetto, I'm a white boy looking, <laughs> but hey, inside, in the blood, it's strong with the, uh, with the, Mexican influence. And, uh, you know, that for me was always a driving force and uh, uh, just a, a motivation to prove that we belong, that we can be out there and play as well as anybody else, that we can climb the mountain too, and, uh, and inspire our youth in those communities to be bigger and better and greater than what they thought they could be or what they've been influenced by their own home to be, that they can get outside of that box and they can truly thrive in life man that's amazing because i i think we we have a lot in common because you know in dallas because it's you know in texas and even in california and there's a lot of it you know makes up the hispanic culture it's it's big here percentage wise and so i always felt like and i don't know about you whenever whenever i started speaking you know because casillas is you know they they identify that culture man you're one of us and i want to be one of them but i couldn't speak spanish it's almost like I felt bad about it and felt guilty and felt shame because I didn't speak Spanish. I don't know if you ever experienced that or not, but, uh, you know, I want to carry that torch, you know, and, and represent. Sure. sure. And I agree with you. I wish that I could speak the language fluently. I wish that we could be more impactful in Mexico, being going, being able to go down there and be an influence uh, in helping some of those communities out as well. But even just here at home, like you said, Texas, California, strong Hispanic influences, large populations uh, from the Hispanic culture. And, and yeah, not being able to speak the language I felt was an unfortunate thing for me, but I didn't allow that to be uh, a reason why I couldn't continue to go out and reach out and give back 
and, and really inspire a young people to be more educated, to give them opportunities uh, for scholarships to go on to college. I did a lot of work with the Hispanic Scholarship Fund back in the day, which I was extremely excited and proud to be a part of. And what we were able to do as far as just giving uh, young students their first opportunity or that family's first opportunity to be a representation in college, to pursue that higher education and to give them that means, that opportunity uh, to help push them, nudge them in that direction meant a lot to me. And it still means a lot to me. And it's what I want to get back to doing because I've taken a little bit of a hiatus. Hey, raising four kids, they're all young, but they're all starting to get involved in sports and their own things as well. And so for me, finding my purpose again and reestablishing that, getting back into the communities, especially the Hispanic community and giving back and touching people's lives because we have a great platform to be able to do that. Yeah. And, and you just mentioned, you, you know, you do a lot of work, your charity, your, uh, the Garcia Passing On Foundation, you provide his uh, scholarship to Hispanic kids. So that's uh, props to you. I, I want to start where, where, where it all began for you. Uh, and I think that, you know, when I, when I think of your career, I think of you, cause it's always the measurables for a quarterback. And I'm sure that that's something you had to fight through, you know, Z- San Jose state. And just as you, you know, going to the CFL, not getting your opportunity to, to to play in the NFL right away because maybe the measurables and you know that adversity. Talk about how that really, you know, fueled you and that fire that really kind of. Well, you use this, uh, you know, the the whole, uh, you know, the the term and cliche about a chip on your shoulder. But how did that drive you through your career? Oh, absolutely, and I think in a lot of ways, there was really the unknown coming out of high school, mm-hmm. wasn't recruited, had to go to a junior college, played for my dad at the junior college in my hometown. It was really at that time that I started to somewhat blossom. I always had the mental ability to grasp the game and, and, and play fast in that sort of way, processing information, but my physical tools weren't quite there yet. I was a late bloomer in a lot of ways. Yeah, I was always a pretty good athlete, but like you said, hey, I didn't have the size, didn't have the extraordinary speed, not the big arm, all those things. But what I could do mentally in processing information and doing it quickly and doing it well, eventually when my physical tools started to catch up, finally found the weight room and started Mm -hmm. to press some weight, started to work on quickness and agility and all those things that would help me within the pocket and just be able to escape, even if it was just to buy more time to get away from that initial rush to extend a play. Um, That started to happen for me at the junior college level. And that led to some openings, not a huge uh, pile of letters coming my way, but I had some D1 offers and San Jose State being right up the road was an ideal fit for me at the time. And uh, going to San Jose State, I just felt like, hey, here's an opportunity to get an education, a free education, because I was on scholarship. I didn't know what the future held. Hey, I was six foot, barely over six foot, six one at the tallest in my life (laughs) and 180 pounds, man. I was 180 pounds when I went to San Jose State. And, uh, you know, for me, it was just about competition every single day, striving to better myself. How could I be better? How could I help my teammates be better? How can I be inspiring and motivating and physical and mentally tough. And I think a lot of that was ingrained in me just in watching my dad, being around my dad, watching him coach, how he inspired young people. I used to look up to those 18, 19, 20 year olds that were playing for my dad at the junior college. Those were my idols. I wanted to play for my dad. I wanted to be like those guys. I didn't really have a vision of, yeah, I had a dream. I had a dream. I wrote it down in fourth grade in autobiography that I'm going to be an NFL quarterback. Shoot, I was 10 years old, man. (laughs) Who would have known? But that being said, we all have dreams, but we don't know if they're going to truly, fully come to fruition. And for me, early on in life, hanging out around my dad's practices, being the ball boy at his football games, man, and watching my dad coach, watching how he inspired people, how he put his arm around and loved these young people was like a father figure to a lot of these young kids who came from all over the country. That was inspiring and motivating for me. And I wanted to be that guy for my dad. I wanted to step on that field and battle 
for my dad. And when I got that opportunity, man, it was one of the best blessings in my life. I, I truly say this in all honesty, my dad is the best coach that I've ever had. That's great. He truly is. And, and Hey, there are those guys that never reach the professional mm -hmm. levels and you know how it is. Yeah. It's a buddy system yeah. in the NFL. Yeah. You get one guy in the door and he brings his buddies along. Mm -hmm. It's not always the best coaches that are at the highest of levels, but I tell you what, there are high school coaches, there are junior college coaches, there are small division three coaches that are truly great at what they do. And it's not just because they know X's and O's, but they know how to bring a team together. They know how to inspire a team. They know how to bring the best out of people. And that's what my dad was. He brought the best out yeah. of me as far as an athlete was concerned. And when I had that opportunity, that's when I started to thrive. That's when I started to take steps in the right direction. Yeah, it didn't lead to being drafted into the NFL, even coming out of the East West Shrine All-Star Game, which you know mm -hmm. at the time was one of the top All-Star Games in the country with the Senior Bowl and the East West Shrine. Those were the top yeah. two games. I was the MVP of the West for that East West Shrine game, bringing them back from a 28 seven deficit in the fourth quarter, running for the two point conversion, three touchdown passes. We win the game. I'm MVP. Didn't lead to anything. Still wasn't didn't enough. Prove, didn't prove to people yeah. at the NFL level that I was capable. I was a record breaking quarterback at San Jose state. Still didn't, wasn't enough to prove that I could step to the next level and play and compete. And that just drove me, man. That was like fuel to my fire. You're going to tell me I can't do something. I know I can do it. I know I'm better than other guys that are doing it out there right now. And I will dominate if given the opportunity to do so. That was just my mindset. Yeah, the chip on my shoulder. Hey, I'm not the biggest, fastest, strongest guy, but I'll run through a goddamn wall if you put it in front of me because that's how I was motivated. And that motivation just kept me going. Hey, 900 people could love me and one person could hate me. It's the one person that motivates me, right. you know, and that's just kind of what my thought process was like and how I was driven and how I was not content, not satisfied. I wanted to still climb Hey, get to the next highest mountain, get to the top of that. Where's the next highest one. And that's how we get to the top. That's how we, uh, shoot. That's how we arrive, I guess. In yeah, just motivate yourself. And that's and look, there's always that person who's going to tell you, you, you suck and you're never going to make it. <laughs> it's like, that's oh, all yeah. I need. This is that, you know, just that doubt, you know, someone, because you know, as being an athlete, it's all about judgmental. I mean, it's a judgmental business and they're all about judging and everything. Um, I, I, I read this story. They got this information about Bill Walsh, who saw you play. I don't know if it was the East, the, the, the East West, the, Sh the Shrine game, but. He pretty much told all the player personnel in the NFL that you got to you got to draft this kid, Jeff Garcia, and and in essence, no team obviously you're no one drafted you. No, you're, you right. didn't even take a chance on that because now I mean Bill Walsh, arguably one of the greatest minds of in football ever. People that don't know, I mean, you just I mean his he's just a legendary as far as that. Telling other NFL personnel and coaches. You got to go take a chance on this, and they and they and they they take a fly. You know, they pass on you. Right. I mean, that's the whole measurable. The whole thing about quarterbacks got to be freaking six four and be pretty looking, and you know, just yeah. you know what they say. Play. Well, I'm not even going to say this, but anyway, that measurable yeah. that, and you know, yeah. more so, especially kind of when your era really wasn't the Drew Brees. It wasn't the big quarterback. It was these big tall guys. But I right. mean, how about that? Yeah. You know, everybody was looking for, as you know, one of your teammates and you guys won Super Bowls yeah. together, Troy Aikman. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wanted that 6'4", 225 pound looking guy. Right. But here's Bill Walsh, who'd been coaching the West Coast system for years, <laughs> had Joe Montana, who wasn't the biggest guy, <laughs> Steve Young, even shorter than Joe, right. but athletic. These guys could move. They can make things happen. So Bill was coaching at Stanford when I was playing at San Jose State. And we played against each other two seasons in a row. And the second year was a dogfight. Came down the last minute of the game, a drive, all those things. They ended up winning the game, but it was a back and forth uh, offensive showcase, so to speak. And after that game, Bill, in an interview, said that kid Garcia on the other side of the field he did some Joe Montana-like things today. Wow. And so I went up to Bill after the season 
And I just thanked him. I actually saw him at the East West Shrine game at the practices there at Stanford stadium. He was walking around and my dad's like, Hey, Jeff, there's coach Walsh. Why don't you go say thank you for some of the kind words that he said to you. So I go up to him and I introduce myself and he's like, Hey, yeah, Jeff, I know who you are. And I say, Hey, coach Walsh, I just want to thank you. Hey, you said some really nice things to the media after our game. And he's like, Hey man, well, you deserve it. You're a hell of a player. You're going to be the MVP of the game this weekend. And, uh, you know, hey, you always have me as a resource if you need it. And uh, so I go out and I'm the MVP of the game. (laughs) So later I set up a meeting with Coach Walsh at Stanford at his office there. And I just go out to him and I reach out to him. I say, hey, Coach, man, you have tremendous influence. You have so many relationships that have come through your tree, your coaching tree in the National Football League that are spread out throughout the league is there any way that you could put a word out there for me? And he's like, I'm more than happy to, Jeff. I'll make some calls. I'll write some letters, blah, blah, blah. He did that. I got one call. I got one call from a guy who eventually would become my coach later in life. But Steve Mariucci was the quarterback coach of the Green Bay Packers under Holmgren Mm -hmm. at the time, which Holmgren came through the Bill Walsh system. So I get a call from Mooch. I'm at my apartment at San Jose State just so happened to be at home and answer the phone because there's <laughs> no cell phones. I didn't even have a pager or beeper or nothing. And I answer the phone. He's like, hey, Jeff, this is Coach Steve Mariucci from the Green Bay Packers. Uh, Coach Walsh had reached out to us, and I just wanted to give you a call. And we're not really looking to bring a quarterback in right now. They had Brett Favre, Mark <laughs> Brunel, and Ty Detmer were their three quarterbacks. We're not looking to bring a quarterback in right now. But if you have an opportunity to go to the Canadian Football League, go get some experience up there, and we'll see what happens in a couple years. And I did have the one team in Canada that had me on their negotiation list, the Calgary Stampeders, Mm -hmm. and that was my only option. I wasn't invited to the Combine. I didn't have any workouts. I didn't even know what a pro day was, to be honest with you, Tony. They said – Meet at South Campus, which is where our football facility was at San Jose State. Mm -hmm. Meet at South Campus at 1230 on Wednesday. There's going to be some NFL scouts there. They're going to weigh you. They're going to get your height. They're going to have you run a 40. I'm like, what the hell for? (laughs) What I knew I need to run a 40. I hadn't even been working on it. I didn't work on a start. I didn't work on anything. So I show up and I go through this process and I'm like, okay, I showed up. I mean, I don't know what that means now, but that being said, what'd you run that you know, the day? The whole process was different back then. What's that? What'd you run that day? Forty oh, times. I, I ran just under a five flat forty. I think what? I was probably like a four nine or something. Dude, you know, man, you got that was, football because, speed though. I, I never could have. That's, the thing. that's yeah. a, eventually, eventually, a couple years later, I started to work mm-hmm. on the whole speed thing, right? And I did run a four six two. So. I just didn't know how to come out of a start, right? Yeah. I never was in a three That's point. That's crazy. Stance. I was never exploding out of a start. Yeah, I could run. I had quickness, agility. I could escape, but I didn't have that. Just they don't. Flat they, they don't point. have these places you go to. You know the uh, you know the sports performance places and get ready for the combine. Right. They have that. right. There was none of that. Back <laughs> no, then. no, no. You know, it was on your own. You were right. at your school. You were just training and yeah. doing whatever you thought you had to do to yeah. prepare, but. That being said, uh, you know, Bill Walsh really became an advocate for me. We kept in touch while I was in Canada. He would try to get me into opportunities. I did go to a mini camp with the 49ers, but I was still under, I was still under contract in the Canadian Football League. So there was nothing really that could come out of that. They just allowed me to go to the mini camp. He also tried to get me in NFL Europe at the time. But because, again, I was under contract in Canada, I couldn't break that. Right. So. It really came down to the time when five years into Canada, I was successful. We had won the Grey Cup championship. I thought that Canada was all that was going to happen for me. I didn't even think the NFL would ever open its door. Well, then Bill got back with the 49ers on the management side, and I had some other offers. I had Miami offering me a contract. I had some other workouts with other teams. But I knew that San Francisco, if they would offer me, was the best fit for me. With Steve Young there, I was more like a Steve Young than I was a Dan Marino. And with Bill Walsh there, I knew I would get a legitimate, a legitimate shot 
to make the team. And that's how the stars eventually lined up. He got that job. He came into a place of influence again. He brought me in for a workout. Now I had to prove in the workout that I was a hey, legit. And but you I got your play. shot. Say that again. And so you got your shot. So I got my shot, you yeah. know, and so that's how it all kind of unfolded. And Steve Mariucci now was the head coach of the <laughs> how about that? 49ers. How about, so how about, how about full that? circle Exactly came. how the connection of that, that would eventually happen. And then, uh, so, you know, Canada, I always in, because I was fortunate, I obviously played in the NFL and I didn't have to go that route, but a lot of guys have gone that route. Did you ever feel like that, was there a lot, any animosity or anything towards the NFL? And it, you said you're more, it sounded like you're content playing for, in the, in the Canadian Football League. And oh, by the way, still have what the, one of the, the game, uh, one game record for passing yardage, I believe five or 500 yards passing. I mean, you got so many records, but certainly there. But I mean, was there any of this like I'm I'm pissed off because I'm playing in Canada when I think I could play in a National Football League? Yeah, well, let me tell you. So my <laughs> first contract was sent to me from the GM slash head coach of the mm -hmm. Calgary St. Peters, Wally Buono. Mm -hmm. He sends me a two year deal, but every contract has an option year. But it's not the player's option; it's the team's option. So it's really a three year package, right? Right. So this is back in the day. Everything's through mail. There's not mm -hmm. email, nothing like that. So I sign the first year of the contract. I don't want to commit to more than one year. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in my mind, I'm an NFL quarterback. Yeah, I don't want to go to Canada for yeah. a bunch of years. Right. So I sign a one-year deal. I send it back. I get a call after they receive it from the head coach, GM, Wally. Mm -hmm. He goes, hey, Jeff, where's the second year of the contract? I said, well, coach. I just signed the first year because, you know, I don't want to go into the NFL. He scoffed on the other end. He, he kind of chuckled. <laughs> Jeff, you're going to be, be in the NFL. Here. Yeah. yeah. Let's be honest here. You're not going into the NFL. You either sign the second year of the contract or there is no contract. Wow. So I'm like, oh shoot. I got nowhere else to go. I better wow. sign that second year. So I send it in, right? I compete in that first year. Not even to be the backup. Doug Flutie's the starter. Steve Taylor out of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. You may remember right. him. Yep. What's the second string guy who'd been in the league for six years yeah. at that time? You guys might be similar age, as a matter of fact. The young, young, young guns. Young man. guy, but, uh, young guy. <laughs> that being said, I was competing to be the number three. I was competing to be the number three on the team. I ended up winning it over another rookie because I had one quarter in a preseason game that I was able to shine in. And that was the difference maker. And, uh, that oh, by the way, what, year, what, what kind of, I see your dog there. What kind of dog you have? I, that's you, got, a goldie. you got to give him some love, man. Yeah. He wants, he wants, he wants his well, actually, he comes from right outside of Dallas, Lone Star Doodles, man. It's, oh, man uh, you got to come all the way to Texas place. to get some, get some high bred I, dogs, brother. I know he's a, he's a great dog. That's he just cool. Wants to love yeah. him, man. He wants to be part of the conversation. Hey, I hear you. But that being said, Hey, I got into the Canadian football league the second year I had my breakthrough. Doug mm -hmm. Flutie went down with an injury. I talk about opportunities all the time. Hey, they're few and far between, but you got to be ready to strike when they present themselves. People have labeled me as being opportunistic in, uh, in the past. And, and really, I believe that, that word does truly identify me in the sense that when that opportunity does present itself, when that crack in the door does happen, you got to be ready to blow it wide open. And that second season, Doug went down with an injury. I was the backup. I step onto the field. I didn't look back. I went eight and one as a starter. Next thing you know, Doug's going to Toronto. I'm still there in Calgary as the starter for the next three years. And eventually we win the Grey Cup. And like I said, yeah, I was getting to the point of contentment. Mm -hmm. I was enjoying my yeah. life in Calgary. City was great. The football team organization was great. Money wasn't anything special. I wasn't making any more than what a rookie contract would be. But that being said, I was doing what I love to do. I had a lot of people that were supportive of me, friends and fans and all those things. It was a good life, man. I couldn't complain. And then all of a sudden things changed and the door opened down South. And that's when, you know, the 49er opportunity came. Yeah. And, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with taking, you know, make, making, you know, just taking tremendous, you know, advantage of your opportunity. I don't care what it is. I mean, you tell them, give me someone that you give them the opportunity and 
for some reason it does you know doesn't you know they don't follow through and when certainly your story man is amazing so opportunist well who cares I mean I think that's a tremendous all right so when you get to the 49ers and you know Steve Young I mean I, I mean the guys of obviously a Hall of Famer tremendous quarterback that whole process of being in that environment you, you, you said you know Mariucci was a head coach and that whole mystique of being a 49ers getting your opportunity to actually play I mean how was that whole I guess relationship with Steve because I know as an older player it's like you you hear it all the time guys mentor quarterbacks but part of me is like I'm not going to tell you everything because I can still play and I don't want this guy to take my job but how was that relationship and how how does your relationship with Steve still continue yeah you know it's it was it was not easy to be honest with you at the start. You know, we had a bunch of young quarterbacks or inexperienced quarterbacks coming in behind Steve. And obviously, Steve, hey, future Hall of Famer, mm-hmm. Super Bowl winner, all those things. But later in his career, not at the end, but later. And, you know, next thing you know, in the third game of the season, he's going down with another concussion. It proves to be the final game that he ever plays in. Uh, but he was a different cat. Um, as much as he should have been the most confident guy, there were some insecurities mm-hmm. within him. And I felt like as a veteran quarterback, as someone who could be a great mentor to me, that initially he wasn't that guy. Is that you overblown, know? that that hole in the quarterbacks now? You're always like, okay, this, they're going to draft – such and such, and he's going to be mentored by you know different players. Is it more the guys that like the Andy Daltons of the league that are mentors? I mean, it's just hard for me to think that I'm going to tell this guy everything that he needs to know so he can eventually take my job. Does that? Does yeah, that? Well, does that? I think that's. I think it's overblown in the okay. sense that hey, and I'm not a selfish. Show, I get it. I, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm going to show you through work ethic, mm-hmm. through right. watching film through how I approach the game, through all those things, as far as what I know, Mm -hmm. how to play the game. If you want to take any of that and instill it in you and it works for you, great. Hey, we're going to talk football. We're going to talk, hey, the process of elimination, walking up to the line of scrimmage, what you do pre-snap, what you do post-snap. I'm not going to be hiding things that are going to be – supportive or help our team win you know and if I'm not the guy out there pulling the trigger I want to make sure whoever is that guy that he has the best opportunity to be successful I never felt that sort of insecurity to not be a great leader not only in the locker room but also in my QB room yeah and my attitude was we're only as strong as the last guy on this team Mm -hmm. we all have to contribute in some way and if that's the second or third string quarterback that has to step on the field at some point then hey they need to be prepared to carry the torch and so I never felt like that now do relationships vary within that room yeah you have some guys that just aren't easy to get along with and one of those guys for me in Tampa was Brian Greasy. He was just a different personality. I'm not saying it was a bad thing. It was just a different thing, you know? And not everybody bonds to where they want to hang on and off the field. It just doesn't work like that. Everybody's got different motivations and different wants and different beliefs and all those things. And so, you know, doesn't mean that the guy was a bad guy. We just didn't buy great. We just didn't have that kind of, bond in the quarterback room and so you know you deal with it and you just kind of make the most or the best of what it is at the time and and try to keep hey everything focused on hey we're here to win football games and I'm here to be the starting quarterback and that's my that's my motivation that's my intention and I'm going to do everything within my power to be the best that I can be and if there's young guys that are learning from me then hey absorb it and take it in because I'm trying to show you how to be successful. Yeah, and, and just the style in which you played. I mean, you were a guy that could really throw the rock on the run, which, which a quarterback, you know, now in the modern day, I mean, you got to be able to do that. But uh, you, make, you made the Pro, Pro Bowl 2000, 2001, and 2000, 2002, right? Um, yeah. Just a tremendous, you know, years of, in, in San Francisco. Um, 
What did you take away from that? I mean, as you move forward, obviously you moved on with the, for Philadelphia, but those first years in the league, I mean, how important was it to develop in the CFL and have a couple of years under your belt and be able to transition in the NFL? And I guess it's a long, you know, long question, but describe the difference between the CFL and the NFL yeah. in, in a nutshell. Well, I came down in the NFL. I was 29 years old by the time I started yeah, my first true. game yeah. in the yeah. National Football League. So maturity that had taken place mm-hmm. in me and growth mentally and physically um, was at a whole different level than a 22 or 23 year old coming out of college. Right. And so there was, there were certain things that playing professionally, even though it was in the Canadian football league had really developed in me, Hey, my thickness of skin to a controversy or criticism or any of those things. I knew how to deal with that. I knew how to play amongst athletes that were better uh, than what I faced in college. I mean, hey, no matter where you go, NFL, CFL, you're going to have better talent around you and you're going to have better talent against you. And so I had adapted to that. I had continued to grow. But I will say this, there were growing pains when I stepped onto the field in the National Football League. The difference between Canada and the National Football League are things happen that much faster. The windows of opportunity are that much smaller. You have a bigger field. You have more space. You have different rules in the Canadian Football League. It's still football. Wider field. There's some differences. <laughs> Wider field, yeah. longer field, bigger end zones. And so now in the NFL, you've got a more supreme elite athlete overall. You have more speed covering smaller spaces of area. So your opportunities are that much smaller. Right. And it took me a little while to adapt to that. And fortunately, because of my experience and probably because of my maturity, I was able to deal with some of the criticism that was coming my way. Because at the time, we were three and one when I stepped onto the field against Arizona and then we beat uh, Tennessee Mm -hmm. in my first start. Tennessee goes on to the Super Bowl that year. My first start is at home against Tennessee. I play lights out, throw for two touchdowns. I don't make a mistake. I run for a touchdown. I'm like, this is easy, man. I got this. (laughs) Well, the wheels slowly started to fall off the next few weeks, right? And I eventually got benched after my fifth start. We were one and four in my five starts. And I was struggling. I had thrown only two touchdowns in that first start. I had thrown nine interceptions. My decision-making, my timing, my own I think confidence had been had been kind of torn apart a little bit. And I looked at me as being the difference of what the 49ers had been mm-hmm. for two decades right. with Montana and mm-hmm. Steve Young. Now they're looking at who's this Garcia? He's the only change in this team and they're losing. You know, I'm used to seeing Super Bowl caliber football, and now this team's not even gonna make the playoffs. And I I assumed a lot of that responsibility. I shouldered that burden initially, and I felt how it was was affecting my reaction, my decision-making. All of a sudden, I was trying to be a perfect quarterback. You can't be a perfect player on the field. I was thinking too much. I was late on decisions, all those things. When I got benched, it gave me a time to step back watch somebody else play the position who struggled just as much as I did and really reflect on how can I be successful? Well, the next five starts that I got in that season, we didn't win any more games, but my production was a reversal of what it was in the first five games. And that led into that second season with the 49ers. And that second season is when I set the record for 4,200 passing yards in a season for the Niners 30 plus touchdowns, my first Pro Bowl. Yeah, we were six and 10. We didn't go to the playoffs, but we were a really good offense that year. And we were taking strides to get back to being the competitive team that we once were. And 30 plus touchdowns, you did that, what, three three times? I did it back to back seasons. Back to back seasons. That's amazing. So, how hard was it? You mentioned you wanted to try to play perfect as a quarterback. And that's, I mean, that's really difficult to to have that type of attitude or uh, just, uh, you know, this this uh, responsibility or just the expectation. But to be able to have to do that behind guys like Montana and Steve Young, I mean, how, was there added pressure because of that? 
Oh, absolutely. I put that pressure on myself. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, carry the torch and not miss a beat. Right. right. But I wasn't those guys. I wasn't Steve Young. I wasn't Joe Montana. Yeah. There were some similarities in how we all played the game, the ability to move, the ability to uh, play inside the pocket and outside the pocket. But that being said, I wasn't them. They weren't each other. They had to create their own identity. I had to create my own identity. And you also had to look at where was the team at that point in the 49er organization. Mm -hmm. When I got to the 49ers, the team had gotten to be a little bit old. There was a transition that was about to take place. They had to really start to replace and improve the team through the draft, through free agency, but they weren't the same team they were for the 80s and 90s when they were competing at the highest of levels. You look at that Steve Young Super Bowl year that he wins uh, with the 49ers when they beat the Chargers, they were the number one defense in the National Football League. Yeah. They had stars across the board on defense. They were amazing. But no one on ever defense. talks about the defense. You know but that, Jeff. Nobody talks about that. You don't need, you don't need defense to win. At, hey, Steve Young led the offense. You had Jerry Rice, and you had a good offensive team. Well, they were lights out on defense. <laughs> hey, thanks for mentioning that, by the way, brother. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, hey, we don't win one without the other, exactly. right? And so, you know, I mean, nobody wants to talk about that, but that's that was the greatness of that team. And so you look at where the team was, and yeah, I put a lot of pressure on myself to step into those shoes. Hey, those were some big shoes, some big voids to fill. I was trying to fill them without missing a beat. Well, that was a lot of pressure I was putting on myself. I had to learn to be me, learn to take this West Coast system, operate it the way that I knew how, not the way somebody else ran it, but the way that I could run it. And that's when things started to fall into place. That's when I started to have the success on the field. And hey, then we were uh, we were moving on up yeah, after that. Off to the races. And then after San Francisco, you went to the Philadelphia Eagles and that whole culture of playing for the Eagles – and you know, honestly, I you know, being a cowboy and playing against Eagles, man, yeah. I hated those damn dudes, man. I mean, I hated the city, I hated everything. Brotherly love, that's bullshit. Okay, I mean, come on, <laughs> I don't know where they got that, but hey, it's <laughs> but, oh, there's no brotherly love. In no, there's games. not, and I can just imagine. And you, I mean, you had a success in in Philly. I mean, you took them to playoffs. I mean, you had some some you know some good times there. But just kind of explain the dichotomy and just the whole culture of playing for the Eagles as a quarterback because man you guys if you guys have a bad week man it's like I don't even want to show my face because it's not it's not good if you're in the Eagles and you're not having a good week right no it truly is love hate I mean they'll love you one day and hate you the next day I mean it it'll change in a heartbeat and uh and I experienced that I mean without a doubt and especially comparing those fans in Philadelphia to fans that I had in San Francisco, it's night and day. You know, they hang on Sunday. The Eagle fans' work week depends on how Sunday turns out. You know, <laughs> there might be a lot of people not showing up to work uh, on Monday. If that it's not Monday, a good I feel Sunday. sorry for it, man. If, you, if it's a bad day, bad or Lincoln Financial, man, I, I feel bad. Yeah, but uh, that being said, you know, I experienced that. My first start. Um, at home was a Monday night game against the Carolina Panthers. Mm -hmm. I had one start on the road after Donovan got hurt. Mm -hmm. I step in. We're, uh, we're five and four at the time. We lose my first start in um, – actually, we were five and five. We lose my first start in Indianapolis against what would become the Super Bowl champions that year with mm -hmm. Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we, you know, we put up points, but we, we don't, don't win the game. We're five and six. We come back home. We have a Monday night game against Carolina and Carolina is a pretty decent time team at the, at the time. There's a moment in the second quarter, we're in the red zone going into score. And I want to say it's Rucker, the nose tackle for the Carolina, Carolina yeah. Panthers, yeah. 300 <laughs> plus pounds, I mean, four or five, 340 probably. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he 370. Picks me up, and you can't do this these days. <laughs> but I get rid of a pass. I'm extended. I'm all opened up. He puts his helmet into my basically my sternum, my yeah. stomach, 
picks me up off the ground and power drives me into the ground, into the turf like a WWE wrestler. All his weight coming down on my midsection, my stomach. I, the wind gets knocked out of me. I'm rolling on the ground. It's the worst feeling ever when you don't have your wind, when you can't get your yeah, air. Yeah, I'm like dead. The worst <laughs> feeling, man. Yeah. I'm rolling on the ground, and the backup quarterback is A.J. Feely. Yeah. He had spent some time in Philly prior to that, so they already knew him. He gets up to start warming up, and the crowd goes crazy. The crowd's cheering. And I'm laying on the ground. That's crazy. I'm like, that doesn't surprise me though, man. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm like, of... hey, every expletive. <laughs> I don't know if I could say it on here, but every expletive is going through my mind. Like, you know what? F you guys. Yeah. I'm gonna show you what I'm all about. Well, I get back up. I get <laughs> off the ground. I brush myself. They start off. booing you. They didn't boo me, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. they did not take booing that you got back up. <laughs> yeah, I got in there. We end up coming back. We end up winning that game. But every touchdown was like, in your face, man. In yeah. your face. Yeah, how do you like me like now? The mentality, like, I became, it was me against them at that point, <laughs> you know. But uh, then we went on a three-game road <laughs> trip. And as you know, the NFC East is one of the most competitive divisions in the National Football League. I mean, everybody hates each other. Uh, it wasn't hey, last year and hasn't been in a couple no, of years. No, it but wasn't back... last year. And they've had their But no, but uh, you're, you're right. You're right. But, yeah. I but just... when things are strong, and at that time, hey, every team was pretty good. You know, every team was battling pretty evenly. I mean, hey, you hate Washington. You hate the Giants. You hate the Cowboys. I mean, that's just how it goes yeah. in that division. Every game is a rivalry in some sort of way. And so we do a three-game road trip, consecutive road trip, all against the NFC East. That's unheard of, yeah, first that's of all. That's a gauntlet three right road there. Games on yeah three road games in a row, and then they're all against your division opponent. <laughs> so we go into Washington, we beat their ass. We go to New York on a Sunday night game, we beat their ass. And then we go to Dallas on Christmas Day. It's a Monday. Mm -hmm. They're doing two Monday football games on Christmas Day, and we took it to Dallas in Dallas. And, uh, you know, that resurgence, that turnaround, made me a fan favorite in Philly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it didn't continue. I was only under a one-year contract. We ended up going to the playoffs. We win the division, first of all. We come back from being five and six at one time and win the NFC division. We beat the Giants in the first round. Then we lose a heartbreaker on the road mm -hmm. in New Orleans at, against the Saints. But uh, I was only under a one-year contract. And so they didn't bring me back. They had Donovan coming back off of his injury. Donovan had done a lot of great things there in Philadelphia. So I went on to Tampa, and I had to turn Tampa's – team around and win the NFC South division the next year. And so, you know, I just had to do whatever I had to do to survive and thrive wherever it was that I landed. Jeff, you mentioned that you went to Tampa Bay, made me think of Ryan Fitzpatrick. Obviously you didn't go to every team in the national football league, but if there's one quarterback today, in modern day football, you can compare yourself to who would that be? Gosh, you know, um, yeah, I think coming out today, I'd be looked at a lot differently than when I came out in 1990. That's true. Yeah, right? definitely. I mean, the style of quarterback today really fits the way that I played the game. And I don't know if I'm necessarily at this guy's level. He's a phenomenal player. But I think there's some Russell Wilson. Yeah, I can see there, that. You know, kind of tied in with a little bit of Drew Brees. You know, I mean, Drew just retired. He was more of an old school guy. But I think there were some similarities where I could play from within the pocket like Drew, but I could extend the play and get outside the pocket like Russell. Maybe not as good as Russell, but I could do that. And both those guys were undersized, are undersized guys. I mean, kind of similar molds in how we were all built. So, you know, I kind of team seem to, I tend to kind of reflect on those guys that have been successful and how they've done it despite not having the, prototypical size and how they've thrived being Super Bowl champs. Um, you know, I think those are guys that, that were similar. Yeah. Well, I mean, you had a tremendous career and uh, just amazing what you're able to do. And, and I think in essence, you know, people and players that, you know, they see, they see other players that play the game and, you know, the, as I mentioned, the, the, the measurables and, you know, everything else, is, it all comes down. Can, can the dude play? Can the, can the guy play? 
And which which means brings to mind. I'm going to ask as far as a quarterback that may be undersized. How did you have to? How did you have to change your trajectory and just the way you see things and windows as a quarterback uh, compared to someone that's six four, six five that can see over? Th- I mean, how do you change it? I mean, is is that is that something that's blown out of proportion? Because these offensive linemen, and defensive linemen are huge. It's a big wall to see over at times. Well, let me ask you this, Tony. Where are your eyes? Are they at the top of your head, or are they about? <laughs> three to four inches down That's for me they're like five inches down because yeah. i got this five five head right <laughs> but that being said a six foot four six foot five inch quarterback's eyes are at about six one yeah six two mm-hmm. right O linemen are six five mm-hmm. six six d linemen d hands are six 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 seven nobody's looking over people you got to find lanes you have to understand what defenses are doing that's a great where personnel is yeah. Where they're going to, hey, man, zone, blitzes, pressures, stunts, all those things come through watching film, through studying the game. And once you line up, you start to process that information. You start to eliminate decisions at the line of scrimmage to simplify the game in your mind. And then it's finding passing lanes. It's also understanding defensive movement. If I'm going to trust a guy's going to be somewhere, I'm going to also trust that because of the defense that they were in, that there's a window of opportunity that I'm throwing the guy open to. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to, man. I Yeah, I couldn't look over people, but I even say the guy who's 6'4 is not looking over people. He may have a little bit slight more advantage in his height, but it's not like he's seeing a very picture clear uh, field from the top of the mountain. Right. He's yeah. still got a lot of stuff in his way that he's got to sift through in order to find success. Right, that's good perspective because a lot of people don't think that way. They just look at, you know, the fact that you're either six foot tall or six five, that you're going to have this bigger advantage of the, of the taller person. Uh, real quick, when it, in, it related to football, because we've got a couple of segments we do on my show, we're going to get to that. Um, and I, I want you to be candid. Favorite and least favorite coach you ever played for, least favorite teammate that you've had that you that you disliked or, or you didn't like. Uh, he's, uh, <laughs> oh well, let me see here. You know, and I'm not coach. trying to lie. I, I just I think that we all have. I mean, especially coaches. I mean, you don't like. I mean, we all have our you know different guys that we're, we're with. Maybe that's like not a fair head- question. Favorite and least favorite head coaches? Yes. Head coaches. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was fortunate to have some great head coaches. I mean, Steve Mariucci, uh, Andy Reid was a great one. I only had Andy for one year, but great coach to be around. I'd have to say from a a, a, a friendship or relationship that I still carry today, Steve Mariucci yeah, was probably he seems like he'd be a good favorite, yeah. favorite guy to be around. Um, Let's just know, keep it at favorite. We won't. We well, won't we go. Can go least favorite. Okay. I mean, okay. I had a favorite right. experience. I, I don't like that. Was, and I hate to say it, but it was in Cleveland under Butch Davis, and okay. it just was a situation where I felt like there was a lack of consistency, uh, continuity, a lack of structure. You can't compete at the highest level when you don't have proper things in place, and there were a lot of missing components in that organization and it starts at the top it starts with the head coach and uh you know it was an unfortunate thing it's not that he's a bad guy i know he's been a coach with the cowboys as well not a bad guy it just wasn't a very well run program and it starts with him and it filters down and that experience out there was a very difficult one you know and so that being said that was probably my least favorite how about player teammate player wise you know hey i love all my teammates man love them all (laughs) you know i mean if anybody's gonna say anything yeah there were issues with terrell owens at times you know and that's been that's a surprise that's a surprise answer talked about and and you know sorry i didn't mean to say that hey dude what he did to the star and in texas stadium man hey look i'm not gonna i'm never gonna forgive him for that and i was there i was there for that and and to be honest with you what the hell was that all about then you were there so how this all I mean, was that just all about T.O.? Did you guys ever, like, try to talk? He did, he did it once, and then he did it twice. 
Right. Was there not so, any type of, you know, talking any type of sense into yeah. T.O.? Was he just, he just did things as, the way he, he wanted He was his to. own person, yeah, man. Exactly. He was, he was going to do what he wanted to do, you know? And, and to be honest with you, how that all played out, that was like the fourth or fifth game of the season. There was no talk as to why or the fact that he would do something like that. And this is how I was. I got to the point with Terrell, with T.O., that when I would throw him a touchdown pass and I would go to the end zone to celebrate with him, he was so into his own thing, he wouldn't really even acknowledge his teammates, right? So it was coincidental that this was like the first game I threw him a touchdown pass and I just turned around and ran straight to the sideline. Wow. So I didn't see a single thing of him running to the middle of the field to the star. What I saw later in the game was when Emmett Smith scored and Emmett Smith runs to the star and spikes the ball down and gets to a knee and kind of at our, at our sideline. And I'm kind of looking at the big screen going, Whoa, what's wrong with Emmett? Why is he pissed off? Yeah, right? You had no, you had going, no idea what happened before that. I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea. The crowd's <laughs> going crazy, right? And I'm sure they booed the first time when Terrell did that to the star, right? But again, I was like running to the sideline. I was high-fiving the coaches and the teammates on the sideline. I didn't see a darn thing that happened. So then at the end of the game, I throw him another touchdown and it kind of clinches the win for us. Mm-hmm. So I'm fired up and I go to congratulate him and he's uh, running full speed at me. And I'm going, where the hell is he going? <laughs> I go to put my hand up and he runs right by me. And there's George Teague running right by me. And I turn around, I go, Oh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> and George Teague got his ass by the way. There was a blow up on the midfield. And I was like, uh, I'm going back to the side. That's line. amazing, like, man. You're like oblivious to this first ha- the first time it happened. And, you're like, and the whole fact that you would never you know, give you props for throwing a touchdown pass like most receivers should, you know, just hold down. Him. But, man, that's a good story. I, I don't think anyone's heard but, that story before. You know before. what? Hey, at the end of the day, we, were, we did a lot of great things on the football yeah. field. Yeah, there wasn't always a great relationship. And at this point in my life, it's water under the bridge. Yeah. And we've reconnected since then, and we've tied up those loose ends. But when you look at his situation, the problems, unfortunately, followed him to other places in the National Football League. And I think that's where people saw, well, maybe Jeff wasn't the issue, or maybe he wasn't the bad guy or whatever. Um, But that being said, hey, he was a great player, and I took him for what he was. He was a great contributor on the field. He worked his ass off, and uh, you know he made a lot of plays for me. Yeah, that's 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 an amazing story, man. I just like that. I, mean, I have never heard that, that before. Was, Obviously, that I haven't. Was the, that was the start of, I think, the monster that started to erupt in To of me against the world because he got fined and benched the next week by Steve Mariucci. That eruption or that um that choice that coach mooch made to discipline to was kind of the end of their relationship to really had a dislike for mooch after that fact and he had a kind of a sense of it's me against the world mentality from that point moving forward and it just you know that kind of this different character, this different person that people started to see out there. Man, you got to be responsible for your actions, but man, that was a tremendous story you just said to tell us. That's that's really cool. All right, Jeff. Now the serious questions. I do a segment, two segments on my show every week. The first one is X's and O's, and it is presented by Dr. Matt Chalmers of Chalmers Wellness in Frisco, Texas. Okay. Uh, this is life stuff, man. So, you know, just feel free. I'm not going to get too personal or anything. You got four kids, right? I mean, I saw a picture of them. Beautiful kids, by the way. What's the oldest What's the oldest one? My daughter. She's 13. Oh, Preston. brother. Uh, yeah. I was going to – I wanted – so I have I have a 21-year-old daughter. But she's – your daughter's a, a teenager now, 13. But 
Any advice you give our listeners as far as raising kids, especially up to the point of having a 13 year old daughter? <laughs> Man, I'm trying to learn as I go. As you know, they don't give you a manual. Do those- they don't give you a playbook and like do this, right? Oh. You've already gone through those teenage years. You had to adapt and adjust. And I think that's what's so great about being an athlete is that you've gone through those type of situations in life, in in competitive sport, where you've had to adapt to things that weren't going right, to things that were going right. Uh, How am I going to be better? How am I going to be a better dad? How am I going to help uh, her understand uh, the things that she's going to uh, encroach in her life and be the best that she can be. But hey, every day is a learning situation and it's a growing, there's a curve to it, man. There's no right way or wrong way. There's a lot I of think, wild pitches, it, man. Likes to go off the grid. Oh, you know yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, I think the main thing for me is just being involved, being supportive, um, taking interest in my children and and what they're doing on a daily basis. And just trying to be one to encourage and and show a positive way of living, you know, and show that, hey, we're going to love, we're going to care, we're going to share that. And uh, that's important. Now, they're not always going to respond the way you want them to respond. Lord, no. They have their own uh, identity and their own thoughts of, of what they want to do in their life. And no one kid is going to be like the other. Right. And you have to love their imperfections just the same. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can't judge because hey, she or he doesn't like the things that you like or they want to do things differently. You just got to love them through it and support them and uh, embrace it. Let me just tell you something. There's a double standard when you have a daughter. I'm sorry. I mean, that's what I told my daughter. I said, "You're you're my you're my princess." But uh, anyway, that's <laughs> that's the perspective. Absolutely. So you mentioned you mentioned earlier the relationship you have with your father, very instrumental in your your career and the mentor. And I think now today and, you know, it's sports, especially youth sports. And as a parent, you wanted to, you know, I always said this, uh, that my, my kids, and I don't know if it was just me, but they, they listen to their coaches sometimes more than they listen to me when it comes to coaching. I kind of back off that. But how did that, how did that really just kind of that yoke between your dad? I mean, how, what advice could you give to parents that really, like us, are in the industry of sports, be able to work with them and not them have this resistance towards your delivery and what you're trying to, your message you're trying to bring. Oh man. I see those challenges today, (laughs) every day, all day, all the time. And, and, you know, growing up with my dad as a coach, I just had this ultimate respect for my dad. And, and, and for me, I was fortunate that even though he was a junior college football coach, there was a time in my early life, when he took a leave of absence from coaching and we had gone through some, some traumatic experiences as a family, losing a brother at a young age, losing a sister at a young age. And so he took a leave of absence from coaching to start up another business in my hometown of Gilroy. But that gave him time to like coach me. And I was going through those years of nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 playing Pop Warner football, playing Little League baseball, playing a recreational basketball, all those things. And he was always able to be there and be my coach. And I looked at it as such a blessing, like, wow, we have this college football coach as our Pop Warner coach. We're getting the best information ever from this guy. And I just wanted to, and maybe it was because I had gone through those experiences with my family. I saw just the tragedy and the the, the, the feeling of, uh, of loss and depression that my mom was going through in wanting to be a good kid, wanting to do the right things, wanting to help to put a smile on their face instead of another frown or sadness. And so I just really respected my dad and what he had to say, how he coached me. And I always wanted to be first in line. I always wanted to be first in the conditioning drills. I always wanted to like make him proud instead of like, being that kid like I see today with even my own kids at times when I'm coaching them and they're out there playing grab ass, talking smack, not paying attention. And I want to crack the whip on them. And it's just different. It is different how you can discipline and how you can speak to kids and 
all that stuff. And I feel the challenges at times when I feel like, hey, I'm like an extension of my dad. I do a lot of things similar to like how my dad did them because that's how I grew up and that's how I know it. But they don't always respond the same way. And sometimes I think, gosh, somebody else needs to coach my kid because I want them to hear it from someone else yeah. and not from me all the time. That being said, I'm also fortunate and blessed to be able to have the time to do it. So I want to be around them and I want to talk to my boys, especially about being better leaders. Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah. working to be the front in the front of the line. You're not going to be that, that slap dick kid out there. That's, that's not taking care of business and, and doing what he's supposed to do. You're not going to disrespect your dad. Yeah. You're not going to disrespect me out there when I'm putting my time and energy to help you be better, you know, and that's what it comes down to. I think, you know, we all go through different struggles, especially when we're trying to coach our kids or trying to inspire our children. And we sometimes think like, uh, they just need to hear it from someone else because they're just not paying attention. But, you know, through the, through the process, you can't lose sight of, Hey, just still wanting to share that love with them, still want to share that instruction with them, that mentoring, that educating all those things that go into it and let, help them understand that, Hey, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to take away from who you are. I'm not trying to make you any worse. I'm trying to make you better, I'm trying to do it in a positive way. Just accept it. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to do that because the social media yeah. and everything, uh, the platform and it's, obvious, you know, we didn't have that you know, back uh, when we were and, uh, and teenagers. I can't I mean, stand the technology. It, it's, and it's all those things. Yeah. It's a struggle because as you know, you grew up, you were outside playing yeah. all day till nighttime beyond the lights coming on. You only came home to eat dinner or to eat food. And then you were back outside with your buddies. Yeah. That's how we grew up. Hey, if it was football season, we were playing football in the park or in the street. If it was baseball season, we were at the field on the weekends playing against each other. Basketball, same thing. Whatever it was, we were trying to emulate the pros and trying to be the best against each other. And we knew how to set up teams and organize things, wiffle ball games in the garage, all those things that we would just create. Now my kids, I have four of them, and I go, they're like, Dad, <laughs> come outside and play with us. And I'm like, that's why there are four of you. You can go outside, you got your own teams. Hey, but like, the fact that they want you to go outside and play with them, that's – yeah. That's <laughs> that's a good thing that's great all right um and, and and i think this would be my last one when it comes to this 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 segment um you, you mentioned your experience with your you know with your your siblings you lost two siblings growing up and now the mental health is in the forefront i mean now it's vogue to to talk about that you know back when i was and i hate to be that old guy but i mean we didn't talk about that it wasn't like accepted but now Mental health is important to talk about awareness. How important is that to you to be a proponent of that and just be this you know be able to talk about it? You know, you mentioned your kids, but just anyone that you come in touch with. As you mentioned, your mother. I mean, I could understand having to deal with that after losing you know two kids of her own, but being able to talk about these issues. Absolutely, and yes, you're right. Back in the day, I didn't start going to a therapist because I lost my brother. I lost my sister. It was like, just wake up and handle the day as it came. Uh, nobody was helping me through it. I was putting a lot of that in my mind. Like, why did it happen to them? Why wasn't it me that God took, you know, and I put a lot of blame probably on God too. Like, why are you doing this to my family? Those sort of things. And really I was able to probably have the outlet through sports to really help my mental health my friendships, my relationships, my teammates, sports, it like occupied my mind to where I was challenged and wanted to do something better instead of just sitting at home and drowning my sorrows in what I had lost. But looking back, I probably did need some help. It probably was necessary to get some help. And I think today we're so much more aware of the mental health situation, how anxiety is such a big issue with kids, especially with what they've gone through over the last year and a half with this pandemic and life somewhat being shut down, so much of their normalcy being taken away. 
and how depression has crept in, how anxiety is an issue, how obesity is an issue yeah. in affecting Amen. children's mindset and their own vision of themselves. Exactly. We're an unhealthy society. Yeah. That's what pisses me off is that we have too many people that are not taking care of themselves and are being pushed down cattle driven down the path of poor choices, poor eating habits, poor exercise habits. All of this contributes to poor mental health as well. Yeah. And you know, that's where we all need to wake up to the issues that are going on in our lives and what we're surrounding ourselves with, what we're tapping into, what our what we're fueling ourselves with more than anything is terrible. Yeah. It's horrible. The food is not good for us. And you know, it's tough to for people to start making better choices because habitually they've gotten themselves into these habits of of poor choices. Yeah. And that's where it has to start young and you know, it has to be part of your daily habits, the consistency of your life. But that being said, with everybody in an iPhone, in an iPad, um, the social media, the expectations, what it's taken away from work ethic, from drive, from commitment to purpose in life, where so many of these young people are looking for instant gratification, instant stardom, um, being stars because they post something instead of truly working at something. That's where, unfortunately, our society has taken a wrong turn. Well, when you got Photoshop, you don't have to work out. You can make your own body, right? <laughs> hey, I need to learn how to Photoshop. No, it's because, man, you look great. I mean, you you look you look like a tremendous. Hey, I am who I am. You, yeah, you and you're in tremendous shape. And that's the thing that I say is like I refuse to get old. I mean, I'm getting old, but old to feel older than I am. So. Right. That's the thing right. about the health and fitness of a former player because, you know, how important is that? I mean, it is important to take care of your your well being, and it, it comes mentally, it comes with externally, and you know, externally and inter internally, but to continue yes. to work out and keep keep active, you know. And Tony, as you know, with a lot of teammates that you've had in the past, lost a few when, of them. Yeah, when the game ends for them, their motivation. Uh, their mentality changes. Everything kind of goes downhill instead of really looking at it like this is a new lease on life. Right. This is a new opportunity for me to reinvent myself, to get back out there, to utilize the connections and my platform of what I did for the last hey, anywhere from three to 10 to 15 years. Um, I have connections. I have resources. I have people that I can tap into, but a lot of them feel lost coming out. And I felt that way. I felt lost at times. And fortunately, I didn't have to lose 100 pounds to get to a stable weight condition. But you know, so many of your teammates had to eat at a certain level. And that was while they were working out. Yeah. All of a sudden, they stopped working out, but they're still eating at that level. Now the heart issues, yeah. all the problems that come with that, the, the depression that comes with that, all those things contribute to the poor mental health. And it, it's, it's a problem in the national football league. It's a problem throughout our society. And you know, it's something that uh, needs to be looked at very seriously. I got news for you. I got guys of your size I play with and, and when they're, they're your size, when they're in the league and they're twice my size now, so it can go yeah. either way. Oh, it I, either way. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's something you need to, all right. Second segment we do every week. On my show is Bensworthy. Bensworthy is presented by the University of Oklahoma Boomer Center. Jeff, <laughs> work sooner program. I thought I'd throw that in there. Hey, man, you got to do what you got to do. All right, so real quick, uh, as you know, and you mentioned the pandemic, you kind of spoke on that briefly, what you've been doing as far as getting through these tough times. You're in California, so, you know, in Texas, it's been a little bit more judicious as far as uh, opening things up, but. Um, I know myself, I have set my big ass in front of the TV and binge watch a lot of programming on Netflix, Hulu, whatever it is, 
What is Jeff Garcia? What do you recommend? Is something that you like to partake in? What do you recommend for the viewers that that you watch? Oh man, I can't wait for Yellowstone to oh, get man. started up yeah. again. That's, that amen, was, brother. Uh, that was intense. Uh, loving that series. Yeah. Starting up, I guess, in a, another day or the twenty fourth. Is that today? Is I it, guess. I thought it was supposed to come on last weekend, but I guess they postponed it and moved it back. But yeah, I, I think it's supposed to launch back up today. So nice. definitely Yellowstone. Hell That's yeah. a big one. Yeah. The other one I really liked and got into, and uh, Jason Bateman is just an awesome actor, but Ozarks. Oh, yeah. Man. I can't Ozarks. wait. How about it's the so ending bad. to that one? How about the ending? But yeah, oh, the ending, ooh. man, with the attorneys. So, hey, I don't want, I don't want can't like, wait to alert. see what happens moving forward. Um, that one, and then... Uh, I was big on billions as yeah. well. I didn't think I'd like it. And initially the start of it, but now that I've gotten into it, I like billions. So yeah. there's a few right there that I would recommend as uh, being binge worthy. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Hey, I know you're doing a lot of things. I know you're an analyst, do you know, for you, the pre and post game show for the 49ers, but you got a camp coming up next month. And I know you do a lot of things for, you know, in the community, uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're, what you got going on and about your foundation and the, your camp that you got coming up in California. Yeah, I'm excited, man, to return to my hometown of Gilroy, the garlic capital of the world, right there in the central coast, 30 miles south of San Jose. Now, you know what? That'd be a great, that'd be a good test because, and I only shouldn't even say this, but you know, you get COVID. One of the symptoms is you lose your smell and taste. And if you can't smell <laughs> damn garlic, man, in your home town. <laughs> Then you definitely got you got the symptom. Got I'm sorry. Issue. Anyways, that's right. kind of yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, I'm so sorry. we're we're having two days of camps for four different age groups, uh, right out there at a beautiful uh, winery out in the countryside oh. that has a bunch of soccer fields slash football fields nice. out there on their property. So we're gonna hold the camp out there. Like I said, four different age groups spread over two days, and then we're gonna have the launch of my foundation party on the friday night uh july 9th and it's the eyes up jeff garcia eyes up foundation and for me eyes up just means first of all the connection here is that when i step into the huddle as a quarterback the center would always say eyes up meaning get your eyes on the quarterback so that's one thing that it means to me hey get your eyes focus in lock in on what we're trying to accomplish here. Secondly is kids, let's get out of the iPhones, get out of the iPads, let's get our eyes up, let's get back to respecting, to communicating, to being able to look a person in the eyes. And then there's also the spiritual side of it. Hey, eyes up to God, hey, he's our savior. He's the one that, hey, is really helping us to redefine ourselves and our lives. And if we follow his path and guidance, then we are bound to have a plentiful life. It doesn't mean that we have to have all these riches and these certain things. Hey, we can be rich and fulfilled from within and we can do that through God. And so that's where the Eyes Up Foundation to me is so important. I want to build awareness, raise financial support uh, for kids, scholarships, community efforts in low-income communities where there's a necessity for after-school programs, for uh, products that can help fulfill these programs, all those sort of things. So we're going to offer out that night at the event, we're going to give away four scholarships to some very deserving student athletes from the two local high schools. I'm excited to do it. We're teaming up with the high school coaches to run the camp. It's going to be awesome, man, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Well, man, I tell you what, Jeff, this has been great. It's been a lot of fun, your passion. And I know one thing, I would have loved to have been one of your teammates because you just kind of exude that passion and just a good dude, man. So I appreciate your time coming on my show. And I'm sure you'll have a glass of wine at at that winery close to that garlic field. Absolutely, man. Tony, (laughs) thank you for having me on, man. And Hey, it would have been an honor to have been a teammate of yours, and that would have made, hey, two Mexicans on the same team. Hey, I like that. The two Mexicans. <laughs> hey, that would be a good tequila brand. The two yeah, Mexicans. Mexicans. Converse on that, man. Hey, brother, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate your time. You got it, brother. Right. Thank you. Thank you, man. I don't know about you, but, man, that was a passionate interview with my boy Jeff Garcia. Two Mex. I love that name. Don't 
I'm trademarking it. I'm patenting two max tequila anyway. But what a great interview. And, man, I love the story about the star, the fact that he didn't even know that that was going on. That was a great story. But fortunately, that's what you get on my show. But anyway, hey, thanks again for joining me. I appreciate, as always, appreciate the much, the much love. And do me a favor, make sure you uh, share our show. Go to Facebook Live where we have our page there. And then you can subscribe to it on, YouTube, on the YouTube channel. Uh, like it, share it on the platform because that's how we grow. And really want you to be part of this. You know, comments, anything that you have to say. Look, man, I'm a big boy. We want to hear what you have to say. Uh, and as always, I'd love to... Uh, for to, to get your comments and i got to give a shout out to our tremendous producer that would be spider behind the glass mz studios and uh, the great kim francis our executive producer does a tremendous job of keeping me on my toes sometimes but anyway thanks for joining me until next week te amo